On today's episode in My Life in Football, we are joined by Luke Jago. Still not recording. Yo. Yeah, my son bangs like a lobster. M25, man, I lost it. Ain't kicking down with the carbon. But I'm rolling with a harm and a cardin. Yeah, 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 my son bangs like a lobster. M25, man, I lost it. Ain't kicking down with the carbon. But I'm rolling with a harm and a cardin. Yeah, I got bass in my car, not talking about no pounds and no brown. M Sport, M Sport, M Sport. Some man spent 30k on a new whip and they ain't got no sound. Luke Jagger, how we doing today, mate? Not too bad. A bit warm over here, mate. Um, 26 degrees over in Norway. So um, everyone's struggling a little bit with the weather, but I think it's the same with you guys over there, isn't it? Mm, yeah, very hot over here. Reaching about yeah. 30 degrees. It's mental. Not used to it over here. So No, it always, it always makes me laugh. The country kind of goes into meltdown a bit when yeah, it's yeah. so hot. And everyone's at the beach and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Because in Australia, it's kind of par for the course sometimes. So, um, mm. yeah, it's say, it must be used to it. Yeah, I shouldn't be complaining too much. It's actually <laughs> lovely, but um, yeah. yeah, not so much on the football pitch sometimes. It makes a bit mm-hmm. makes things a bit tougher. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, how have you been coping with the whole lockdown thing? Yeah, it's been it's been okay. Um, our club's been brilliant throughout. Um, a lot of clubs in Norway, because of the social system's quite strong. A lot of clubs in Norway ended up getting kind of, it's like a furlough type thing um, where mm-hmm. the government takes over like 80% of the payment. Um, but our club's been really good and which means we could train throughout. So as soon as we kind of got the call that it was okay to start training, we've we've probably had two, three weeks training on top of most, most teams over here. So I think that gives us hopefully quite an advantage going into the season, meaning we can stay fit and we've done mm-hmm. done been able to have some more time with some tactical concepts and, and things like that. So... It's, yeah, but I mean, it's, for me, it's actually not too, too big a difference. Um, I tend to do a lot of work from home and doing various kind of things on top of football at home as well. Right. So I am yeah. kind of used to being stuck in the house. I was in the Faroe Islands and that was a lot of, a lot of being in the house. So um, it's, yeah, it's not been too bad for me, mate. But um, it, yeah, it's, I guess it's just more more tough to see how it is in the world for some people. I think some people really struggle with the isolation and and things like that. So it's kind of hoping, fingers crossed, that things can get back to normal soon. Mm, how about yourself? Definitely. Been all right. I've been all right. Obviously, starting with the whole, starting with this whole interview thing. Um, mm. Been enjoying it. So, you know, hopefully carry well, on good. with that. that will get yeah, me I mean, that was the thing I spoke about with a lot of my friends was like, it's, you maybe you've got a bit more time to do the things you've always thought about, but you didn't want to do, or you didn't have time to do. Um, So I know for me, like actually Corona time was, was an amazing time because a lot of people were home as well. Um, So you've got a bit more time to connect with friends and family. And then also a lot of just speaking with people who, you know, you're sharing different types of knowledge and and things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, And, you know, I was able to have some really, really good conversations during this time that with people who are probably a bit too busy to do it at any other time, you know? Yeah. So it's been, from my point of view, you just try and make the best out of a, of a weird mm. situation and, and, and go from there. Definitely. Definitely. How have you been keeping fit over this period? Yeah. It's like I said, it's, it, it's not been too bad. There was probably about three to four weeks, I think where it was, we were without the team. Um, and obviously all the gyms were shut and stuff. So it was a lot of home workouts, which gets, I was doing like home workouts with like random inanimate objects, like filling up bags with things to try and get a bit of weights on my back. Managed to get some weights from, from the club towards the end of it, which was good. Mm. Um, and then, and then was just doing general interval stuff as much as you can really do. And, and actually uh, did a little bit of did a little bit of pitch work because we've got really good facilities here, so the pitch wow. was was open. So I just kind of did as much to keep myself ticking over. But you know what it's mm-hmm. like; it's never the mm-hmm. same as as training and games, and you kind of yeah. get back. It, it was it was really hard because obviously in Norway, like it was different. We were in the middle of like our preseason, right. so okay. we built up for two three months almost because um, the the preseason here is really long in Norway. And so I'd built up all my fitness. We'd started playing games. Um, 
and then and then all this happened so you kind of lost all that progress you right. worked pretty damn hard over two three months to get but i mean in the scheme of things like comparing to other things that have been going on with other countries and clubs i think we've been very lucky mm. so mm. yeah before we get into the whole you know football thing we'll start mm. with what how do who if you had to represent a country at international level, would you yeah. represent Australia? Because, I mean, you've got Austria, you've got England for your parents, and you've got Australia. I mean, you're very diverse, shall we say. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. It's definitely, um, definitely Austria is probably not in the top two. Um, right. I would, if I would say, I would, probably have to say Australia but I have a really strong affinity with England I mean I grew up in an English household both my parents are English um and all my family's English so when the World Cup's on and England's having one again or as opposed to last last international tournament when there was a bit of hope I was absolutely buzzing and I'm and I'm watching every England game and I'm I'm like a fan um but because I think, you know, I've lived in Australia most of my life and, yeah. and most of my, my friends and stuff are there. So I think it would, ju- it would just tip it to play for Australia. Um, and, uh, and yeah, with my brother, my brother played for the national team as mm-hmm. well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the long off dream was to uh, maybe get on the pitch together, but I don't know if that's a, a possibility in the, near, in the future, but you, mm-hmm. you never know what happens. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned your brother. Uh, mm. To seeing his success, does that make you want to push on yourself, try and match the level of your mm. brother? I mean, there's got to be some brotherly competition in there somewhere. I would say, like, when, when we were younger, there was somewhat of it. Mm-hmm. You there? We're back. Yeah, we're, we're right. Back. Right. Okay. All right. Just happens a few times. We'll have to skip to that. Yeah, me and my brother. I guess when we were younger, when you're a little bit more naive and and stuff, there was a little bit of a competition. Yeah. But I would say from like, I realized like it's because me and my brother literally signed in Europe on the same day. Like I felt really sorry for my mom. She lost both of us pretty mm. much on the same day from Australia. And, um, and, and I realized on that day, like I wasn't jealous that it would happen at the same time. I was just buzzing for him. Yeah. And it's been the same thing since it's never really been like a competition for as cliche mm-hmm. as it sounds like I don't, I don't look at it as like that. I'm just kind of buzzing that I think we both as well see that we're both equally important to each other's journey. Like my brother knows that I wouldn't mm-hmm. have got to the level I got without him. And I'd hope he'd maybe think the same. So, um, so yeah, it's 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 not a not a competition at all. Obviously, if we're playing FIFA, like, or mm. if we're playing on the pitch together, Different there's, there's there's competition. And if like when we used to train together, we would volley volley the heck out of each other. Mm. Um, but in terms of like that type of stuff, I think we're really lucky that we have such a such a close relationship. It kind of supersedes all those all those kind of thoughts and feelings. So yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so we'll start right from the top. We'll go from um, what were your earliest memories in football? Did you have any idols, you know, stuff like that? Yeah, um, I guess like starting from the very beginning, my the reason I actually got into football was because my mum had me and my brother in the afternoons and she couldn't like have my brother go into training and have to look at after me kind of at the same time. Like it would have been a nightmare for her. Mm -hmm. So my brother was like, the coach was desperate to have my brother at like, I think it was under sixes because in Austria they start really early and, um, or maybe a little bit older. And she pretty much said to the coach, like, unless you're going to take the little one as well, Mm -hmm. like you're not, um, you're not getting the older one. So that was the first time. I kind of started playing and then um, and then yeah from that kind of moment forward like the love just grew I remember like me and my brother we had a DVD from or DVD, maybe it was even a VHS tape at that time mm. makes me sound old compared to now um, of the 99-2000 United season when they won the treble 
And I remember me and my, me and my brother just literally watched that like on repeat every morning. Mm -hmm. um, we were watching like Dwight York and Andy Cole together and like David Beckham was just ridiculous. Yeah. And I think that was kind of like when me and my brother really like fell in love with the game and then and then from there it just grew and obviously I was really fortunate to have my brother. So like if I needed someone to have a kick about with, you know, we were constantly like winding dad up, playing in the back mm -hmm. garden and, and tearing up the tearing up the grass he'd spent hours <laughs> trying to manicure. So um so yeah and then and then I guess players Gerard, Ronaldinho, I loved Ronaldinho when he first went to Barcelona and was right. yeah. trying all the tricks and thought I would be a number ten, but that definitely didn't go that way. Um so I guess those were like the the early memories and, and playing playing in Austria where where we were I think lucky to have a really good education when we were younger. Um, because they're in Austria, you know, you have like you play the season for half the year with like on the grass and then you're in in playing indoor and playing futsal for like the winter right. season. Yeah, okay. So you get a lot of a lot of practice which is always good at get at a young age. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then move move to uh, Australia comes about. Did you just kick on with football there as well? Yeah, it was actually quite it's quite a funny story. Just before we left to go to Australia, me and my brother both got a uh, invitation letter from Austria Vienna to join the right. academy. Okay. And I remember our parents like hid the hid the letter from us really? because they knew that if we found it, like yeah. before we went to Australia, there was no way we we're leaving. And mm -hmm. and my brother ended up signing at Austria Vienna like 10, 15 years. I don't know how many years later it was, but so football is weird sometimes um mm -hmm. so yeah so then we we moved to australia for for my dad's work um and then it was the same thing we continued continued playing in australia continued on with um with the football and just kind of worked our way up through through the ranks um in yeah. the australian kind of pathway mm. um so so yeah it was it was interesting like coming from europe i think i definitely had like a head start on players my age so when I first arrived in Australia, it was probably a year before I got put up in age group. Right. And then stayed up, stayed up in age group for a couple of years, which I think really helped my development. Mm. Um, and had some really good good young coaches as well when I was younger. And and also like, it's 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 a big thing is like having like my brother around, honestly, to play with him and also like play football with his friends. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to a coach the other day, and there was something he said he noticed that. That the younger brothers, not that I'm, I wouldn't say exceptionally better than my brother, but he would say that most younger brothers, like they, they probably get some added benefit from playing with older players and playing at a higher level than, than what they play at. So, mm. um, so yeah, I think that really helped me, and I was lucky, kind of in that part of my my development. Yeah, yeah. So then, Melbourne victory. That's where it all really started. Yeah. So then. Yeah, I guess in Australia we had kind of like it's similar program to say Claire Fontaine and, and Lillishaw where you have like regions, so there's five states, God, I think five or six states in Australia. I shouldn't be getting that one wrong. Um, and then each of those states have like something called an institute of sports. So it's pretty much right. developing sports um for the Olympics and because Australia right. Australia was competing in the Olympics with soccer. Uh, each state got their own program. And then if you did really well in that program, you went to the national program. So yeah, that was yeah, kind of yeah. like my, my big goal was to make that program because once you get into that pathway, like it makes your progression a lot easier. Hmm. Um, and my brother had been through that program. Um, and again, like even then, like my brother had, like I, I, I had went the hard way. Like I got like a half scholarship, what they call, which meant you were pretty much training for yeah. a year just to kind of prove yourself whereas mm -hmm. my brother went in at full straight away but it was never like it was again never like a competition thing so i went um went up through through the scholarship kind of route and did better and better and then because i was in the vis that's where a lot of victory take a lot of their players from mm -hmm. and then um and then yeah i managed to get the chance with the victory youth team at 15 16 and then stayed with the club for pretty much five five years, um, mm. which was an amazing period, but probably didn't end up the way I pictured it to end up. 
mm. um, because I never got to play for the first team. I played most of the, my last preseason, put most of the first team games, and was on the bench against Liverpool, but never really, never really got on and cracked cracked the first team, which was probably yeah. at that point was the biggest setback I had in my career, and I found really hard because. Victory was like my boyhood club and I'd spent five years there and, and mm. the whole way I felt like I was on the pathway to kind of making my way into the first team. I'd, I'd done well and in, especially in my last year, done well. I was captain of the youth team and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. So that's, uh, that's football, mate. Yeah. Mm. Mm. How do you say that maybe you got some leadership skills you know things like that being the captain did you feel responsibility for the team and do you think that set you up for you know football in in the in the future years yeah it's kind of I don't know if it I mean you learn to like be a leader obviously more being a leader but I also think it's like a natural thing some people tend to fall into it and I think that's actually quite a hard thing to develop um, mm. and I was always naturally not that I was just wasn't afraid to speak my mind in if it was a meeting or if we're in the middle of the game. Like I'm tend to be quite vocal because I'm passionate on the pitch. I have a bit of white line fever, and if something's good, I like to tell people it's good. And if something's not so great, like I can't. Yeah. If it doesn't hit hit certain standards that we have in the team, I will tell people, and I hope they do the same with me. So yeah, I definitely think it it helped me from that point. Especially I have one youth coach, Darren, Darren Davies, and he was really good with me as a leader and kind of gave me a lot of freedom mm -hmm. to kind of lead the team. And I guess, yeah, now when I look back at it, you learn things because you get to deal with players mm -hmm. Definitely. on almost like a coaching level. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. I, would, I, would have that, I would have that responsibility to go if there was, for example, younger boys coming up and training with us if they were 15 and we were like 17, 18 to try and take them under my wing and help them and make sure they feel comfortable. Yeah. And those were kind of maybe those things which I learned like personal skills in terms of like, you know, how to get someone who's newly to the club to feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And I guess to be fair, now it's a really good point. Now I actually think about it. Um, you know, it's helped me like over here, it's always been a thing that um, I feel like I've, I've been okay with is that when we have new players come to the squad, I tend to try and make an effort with them and make them, feel welcome and comfortable so yeah I would definitely say it did help but there was also probably some qualities there initially which meant that I actually got the chance so yeah mm -hmm. how how was it playing at um you know Melbourne Victory's academy um you know Melbourne Victory were probably probably at that time one of the biggest well if not the biggest team in mm -hmm. Australia um, recently, you, you know, you've had Sydney FC come about, um, but, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, um, you know, Melbourne Victory still are the biggest team. Um, mm -hmm. How was that as an experience, you know, being in, in that academy, you know, at a very uh, professional level? Um, how would you say that, you know, being in, being in that academy set you up for you know, future endeavours? Yeah. Um... Like, I think there's massive, there's big positives to it, but there's also big negatives. Um, right. In terms of the positives, like, I got the best, I think probably best development coaching I could have got at that age in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty, pre not pretty certain on that, but I would say that that's a fair call to make that I, I got definitely one of the best educations I could get football-wise. Um, yeah. I had an excellent coach in Darren Davies, um, Mehmet Jurakovic when I first came. Mm -hmm. I was in and around Kevin Musker, who's, I think, going to be a terrific coach or is already a terrific coach, but he's headed into Europe now. And I was under Ange Postacoglu, who is probably, in my eyes, the best coach Australia's ever had. Um, and to be under those guys and, and really they make you look at football in a different way. And they gave me a lot of tools that I realised once I got to Europe that were so valuable and allowed me to kind of stick the path in Europe because I, 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 I had that variability in my game. Like I'd given been given the tools, the all round mm -hmm. tools. And I think that's the biggest thing I look at with my brother, why he's been able to stick out in Europe because it was the same thing. We both got 
given a really like it's it's a funny analogy yeah. but like a toolbox and we had so many different kind of things we could do with our game that it meant that we could adjust to whatever came our way in Europe yeah. um and so from that point of view I think we were really lucky and like the facilities and stuff and yeah like yeah. like victory for me it was like it, it's probably been the toughest club for me to leave at the time um because of and even the atmosphere like a lot of the guys the staff from you know the kit men even were, were terrific there um and like like when i had my major injury they stuck by me which was really good and let me come in and get free free physiotherapy and stuff yeah. so but in terms of like the negatives which isn't uh none of them are a criticism of victory they're more just of the situation is like i was competing in the other youth teams they were competing maybe just that youth team Whereas at Victory, everyone wanted to come there. So all the guys who like that National Institute I was talking about, all those guys were, um, were, would come to Victory. And so I would say that was kind of the nail in the coffin for me was when we signed a couple of boys from the, the Australian Institute of Sport, um, yeah. which kind of, I would say, probably blocked my path to the first team. Okay. Right. Um, and then, and then, and then also like the sheer quality of players. Like when I was there, I had like Mark Milligan in front of me, Billy Seleski, my brother. Um, and, and we just, because we we're one of the biggest clubs, we had a lot yeah. of depth that other teams didn't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. So that made it really hard for me to crack, crack the first team as well. And I think if I'd maybe been at another youth team, um, I probably would have got a chance in the first team. And then, and then because in Australia, like the way the system's run, because there's a salary cap, right. although teams are like, for example, like you rightly said, Victory is one of the biggest clubs in the league. It's not like if you're at Manchester United in Europe, if you don't make United, like maybe someone in the Prem will take you. Like if you're a top player if near United's first team, you'd maybe get someone in the Prem. But in Australia, they don't, they don't see it like that. Right. So as soon as I'd kind of missed my chance to get into the first team at victory, it meant that I just wasn't going to get, I couldn't get a sniff anywhere else. And, and those were kind of the, the hard things about being at the club. But I mean, in terms of like my overall impressions of the club and everything, I still have like really fond memories of, of it. And, hmm. and they definitely would play a massive part in my development. Hmm. Yeah. So when, when you, when you got let go, um, were you, did you consider, you know, dropping into more amateur level football in, mm -hmm. in Australia? Yeah, so it was a bit of a hard one, like when I got let go, because at the time, what happened was we had like an Australian a AFC squad. So usually like the players who were on the fringe of the first team, like myself, like I was training with the first team. Like I said, I'd done really well in the preseason, played all the games. Mm -hmm. was disappointed not to get off the bench against Liverpool because I'd played all the preseason games. Um, and then, and then I didn't get picked into like a, this champions league squad. And then straight away I knew that, Oh God, there's, there's mm -hmm. something wrong here type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so pretty much we, I had time left on my contract, but the club kind of said like for the remainder of my contract, like, cause our season was finished with the national comp with victory. So I went out on loan um, and in my five games into my loan spell, I tore my ACL and wow. my lateral ligament and pulled my hamstring tendon off the bone at once. Wow. So that was like perfect timing when you're going out of contract and you don't have a club. Yeah. So I spent, um, I spent a year rehabbing and then I was just really like kind of unhappy with my life because I'd spent five years pretty much as a professional footballer almost. And that was for me, the only thing that I was going to do. And yeah. even just little things like I would go over to my friend's house and we all, everyone would be enjoying themselves. And, um, and I just had this nagging feeling in the back of my head that like, I wasn't happy. Like I wasn't doing what I was meant to do. Right. Okay. And I even had that when I was playing in the second tier, which is like almost amateur because it's not very professional in Australia. Yeah. And I just said to myself, like, this is not, I can't, I can't do this. Like I need to give it a crack overseas. Yeah. Um, and so then during, I didn't, it was really hard to balance it because I was doing my rehab for my knee and had no money because I didn't have a contract right. coming in. 
So I was kind of balancing work in and uni and, um, and rehab. Um, and then once I started getting back into it, the last six months, I played for a second division side in Australia and just worked part time in like a call center it was almost pretty much full time in a call center just to get as much money as I could because I knew I was just going to go overseas and try my luck and buy pretty much a one way ticket. Okay. So, um, which is, yeah, maybe a question you're going to have next about how I got to Europe. Um, mm-hmm. so I guess I can take it in one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, so then I, I, which was really rough, like, cause the, the Australian teams in the second tier only train like two or three times a week. So yeah. I was like full time at work, nine to five, getting up at six just to get there on time. And then after work, I would have to go straight to training. Um, and that was only three days a week. And then the days when there wasn't training, the daylight went after five. So it meant that I had to get up at like 4 a.m. and go do a kick in like just light on the training pitch that um, Victory used to train on because there was nothing right. else in the city. So it was like, it was so rough to be honest, mate. Um, and like, I was dry, I was even doing like career work for extra money. And we would, I remember one day we were driving past Victory's training and I like had a package in my hand, like doing this career work. And it was just like the most, it was a really hard moment, yeah. but it was all kind of fuel in the fire for me to, to go on, fuck this, I'm going to go overseas and, and prove myself type thing. So yeah, so I booked a one-way ticket to Europe um, and, I, and I just literally went on Facebook and just badgered every single person I had on my contact list right. about agents and getting trials. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I landed in Hungary first with a mutual friend there who was, who was really good to give me a place to stay and provide me with a club to train with. And mm-hmm. um, um, so yeah, so... I literally knocked about in Europe for three months, different trials, nothing was really falling because it's just lottery, mate. Like when you're Mm -hmm. trialing, it's just absolute lottery. Um, And then towards the end of it, like it was, I'd gone through the December window and there was nothing. And I just got this call from, from an agent who knew an Australian guy who who I've gone to be really great friends with, he's a great agent and person. And um, he was like, do you want to go to Flora? And I was like, what is Flora? And it was like, I went and looked it up on Google and I couldn't, I literally couldn't find anything from the football club at mm. the time. And it was just this, I knew it was 10,000 people in like a fishing town. Yeah. And he was like, the club will fly you there and put you up. And if you don't like it, you can just go home type thing. And I was like, you know what, this is, I might as well give it a shot. Like just to visit even Norway. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I got there and I just realized like, holy shit, this, okay, they're third league in Norway, but this is serious. Like, like mm. I said, it was so professional the moment I got there, like the way the club looked after me and everything. Um, and like in, in the second week being there, I was playing in like a full, not a full stadium, but like a all the way around stadium, which was just never going to happen in Australia in the second yeah. year. Um, and so, yeah, and I signed my contract and kind of, Five years later, I'm still in Norway. So yeah, mm, yeah. I mean, imagine if you you never went, that would have been what. Yeah. What do, you, what do you reckon you would have done? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you never know. For example, like one of my really close friends, or probably my best mate, he, him and me had like a very similar like playing trajectory, and he's gone into like more. He's gone into the corporate world. He's working as a consultant. Right. And he's doing he's doing brilliantly, and he just absolutely loves his life. And yeah. you know, he's it's something we speak about now, even because with my career, like the way it's gone now, like I'm starting to think about other things outside of football because I'm getting a bit older. And it's one of those things I think you just adapt. Like it probably it would have been really hard the first six months to a year, but you never know where things lead you. And so it's the same now. Like I've had probably the last year or two has been a really big dance spell in my career compared to my first three years in Europe where everything was going up. Yeah. But you just try and like, and I have to constantly remind myself to do it, but you just try and stay in the present moment as cliche as it sounds, because if you start thinking about like what ifs and stuff, you'll go, you'll go mental. Like I've got so many Mm -hmm. stories like that in football. So 
But I think one thing for sure was that I was always going to try my luck in Europe. And I, and like I always said, when I went over, when I booked that flight, I always said to my parents and I was actually very lucky that with my parents, they were so supportive the whole way. Cause I literally just said, I'm not doing uni or anything for a year. I'm just going to give up a year for football. And they were like, we have no problems with it as long as you, you sort yourself Mm. financially and stuff like that. Um, so, so yeah, you just try and not, I think, think about that situation because if you start getting to what ifs it's always one of yeah. those one of those things so yeah mm. so moved to Norway happened and then what happened from there just continue playing or yeah so we um I was really lucky my first year in Norway we got got promoted um and it was just such a surreal experience. We was like a town of 10,000 people. And especially it was hard for me. The first six months, I, I didn't play at all. Like, wow. cause I had to get used to the cultural differences. Like in Norway, it was very direct compared to Australia. Um, but yeah, so we were, we were tipped to finish sixth, And we went on a run like half to the midway point where we won 14 games on the trot or something. Wow. And it was just like no one, like it was it was a huge deal at the time because we were such a small town and place. Um, and then we got so we got promoted in my first year, which was just probably the best experience I've had. Like when you're winning week on week, and and then you finally like get promotion. Especially like we were getting pretty much promoted into a professional league, which meant that yeah. like the stadiums you started playing in front of like tens of thousands of people, and you're playing against mm. proper players. Like I got to play against. Nigel Rio Coker and, and yeah. some like really players that I wouldn't have probably ever got the chance to play against. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and then we had two seasons in the second tier in Norway, which the first year we were amazing. We finished eighth. We were actually on for promotion at one point to the top tier. Mm. And then and then football brings you back down, mate. You We didn't do well. This, I think we got a bit complacent, if I'm being honest, in the, in the, third, in the second year. And we were punished for it. Um, so, yeah, and then, yeah, and then I guess moving on from Norway because I went to the Faroe Islands after. Um, I went, I decided, so I'd been two years in the second tier in Norway mm-hmm. and I just decided that I thought it was the right step for me to try my luck in different countries and especially I'd had some interest from England, which has always been because of my family. Right. UK was kind of like a region I wanted to go to. Yeah. So yeah, I went to England. I had a f- couple of trials at League Two clubs. Um, okay. And uh, it was like the same thing. They were, which is a frustrating thing. Is like you get the message, like yeah, you you're a good player and you're comfortable at this level, but it's not. We're not quite going to go for it. Like usually, size was an issue for me because I'm not the tallest player. Yeah, happens a lot of football. But also, like as well, like I completely understand it. Like one of the clubs. Uh, they were looking for a centre mid and then they signed a guy and he was actually my size. And I was like, well, was it a size issue? Right. And then, and then I look at his CV, he's got 600 ga- league games. Like he's played 600 games in the football league. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, like English clubs, they probably, I think personally would have been like, he's a decent player. Like he can play at this level. But if I bring a guy in from Norway second tier and it doesn't work yeah. out, yeah. I'm getting a lot more abuse than if I bring a guy who's got 600 league games, and as and I completely understand that. Yeah. So it was it was I guess the biggest one was I had a trial in Scotland in the top division there, and I did really well. And this is what I mean when I talk about what ifs. Like I did really well in my t- first two weeks, and the club really liked me. Right. And it was like talk about me staying on, and then like we had two trial games, and I just. The first game, I just it just got to, to me because I was so close to kind of the dream of playing in the UK yeah. and had a really I had a shocking game to be honest. Right. And um, and that's how thin the margins are. Like if I just had the game of my life, it's one game, it's one ninety minute game. You know, if I had maybe had the game of my life, like I would have signed and I would have played in Scotland, and it would have been a completely different story. But like at the same time, I you know, I I didn't know better. Like I was trying my best, Mm. Mm. you know, it wasn't like I went in there ill prepared. I probably went in there too prepared. Like I was probably Mm. wanted it too badly and, and the moment got to me and stuff. So, 
so it's all kind of it's all kind of learning curves and um and yeah after that i uh because it was like i left it really late in the window and and then i went with a team in norway a, a really good team in the second tier and they took me on to a camp in spain on the last day of the window on the last wow. week of the window okay and so i and they needed a midfielder and i pretty much thought that was a done deal and yeah. that didn't happen either so I mean, on the on the surface, like it's you look, it's one of those ones like you have a fair few trials, and on the face face surface, you probably say, well, if you've had seven or eight trials and it's not worked out, like in my whole career, like if you look, I've had probably ten trials and maybe two or three have been successful. Right. But I think it's just one of those things that it's so it's it's one week and it's so hit and miss and. And in in reality, I don't think the levels between players are that actually that big. Right. So, you know, like you can go to teams. This is why I realized like I've trained with teams at a much higher level than what I've played and I can go into training and I can, and I can cope. And it's probably the same for players who come from two tiers below me. They probably, there's some players who can step up to my level and can probably do yeah. a job as well as me. So yeah. I think there's a lot of that kind of luck in football that people underestimate. And me now I'm doing, I'm working as well in like scouting. And I think that's one really exciting part is that you can find players at levels that you never thought would be able to yeah. jump up to another level. And they can, because these days with like with globalization, the amount of information on the internet, like the gap, I think in, in coaching between the bottom levels and the top levels is drastically reduced. Hence why the difference between players has as well. So it's all all learning curves, mate, and and life experiences. Yeah, yeah, and then so, yeah. More recently, you know, you've been back in Norway, doing your thing. How how was it before? You know, COVID hit, and we're in lockdown. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I've come back to Norway in the third tier again, which was hard for me because I've got two seasons full experience in the league above. Yeah. And when you played at that level, you automatically assume that you could probably do another season there, especially yeah. when you're kind of 26 and in, in your prime. But again, like there's so many players out there and I understand clubs, they've only got limited spots. So, you know, yeah, I had yeah. to settle in the third tier, but I came to one of the biggest clubs in the third tier and, um, and kind of like a really project club because okay. they have a huge history. They sold... Sold Holland to uh, Mulder, who's now at Dortmund and probably right. one of the best young players in the world. Yeah, yeah, only yeah. a few few years ago, so there was there was a lot of potential here, and I was really happy to to sign here eventually. Um, and yeah, and then and then and then that was was the situation. So since since I've signed, like thing, it's been really interesting because I've I kind of said to myself this year that because up until to a year ago, up until six months ago, I was constantly, I had put so much pressure on myself to every year, like my goal was to step up a league pretty much mm -hmm. in Norway. And I did that almost my first two years. Um, so I've always like had a lot of pressure on myself personally to reach higher levels. Right. And I kind of just said to myself this year, like, just don't, because I realized like I didn't take in the moments, like some of the biggest moments I've had in my career, I never took them in because I was always thinking about the next step yeah. and the next game. And so this year for me was just like, just don't think too far ahead. Just try and enjoy the year and be in the moment when you've got big games and you get big wins and, and stuff yeah. like that. So I've just been trying to do that, which is a constant struggle not to, you know, go into old habits but but yeah so now we're just waiting pretty much for the season to start in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. so yeah so, hopefully yeah. You'll, you'll get back on the field you know doing your thing yeah mate so it's been actually quite a bit of time since i had the last competitive game because the pre-season's so long here yeah so but i mean like i know with the club here like we've got a really good fan base and if we can get They've they've lost like they've lost that a little bit. I think the fans have been a bit frustrated yeah. in years gone by because of the traditions of the club, which is understandable as well. Um, and I think if we can get ourselves up near the top of the table, we'll be getting a really good atmosphere, at games and stuff. And I think yeah. it'd be kind of amazing to be part of that journey. So I'm just hoping that 
we can get off to a good start of the season and um, and go from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Would will that be behind closed doors? Yeah. So right. uh, we had we had a we had a training game yesterday, um, a, a practice game against another club, and that was was completely closed doors. So I think for the foreseeable future this year, I think yeah. it will probably be closed doors. So actually. Yeah. That negates the point I just said <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that um, yeah. that it would be good to get the fans in, but as I'm just happy to be playing, mate. To be honest, because it was yeah. like training's one thing, but you just want to get on the pitch and play games. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you've reminded me now that we're not going to get the fans. So I'm a little bit sad about that, but there's nothing, nothing we can, nothing we can do about it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you think do you think fans play a massive part in football? Yeah, hundred percent, mate. Yeah. Like I, the the moment I realised it the most has been now when right. I've been watching the the games like the Premier League and it's just it's it's just not the same. Yeah. Like it's and and I don't I don't actually tend to, like I, when I watch football like I tend to like I'll sometimes have it like a notepad and a pen because I'm really into like t- football tactics and coaching and. Yeah, yeah. And stuff but even now like I've been like struggling because I'm like there's just something else when the fans and the atmosphere and it made me realize like they literally make like at least half of the game like all the player quality is important but the fans are so important and then just like mm-hmm. on a personal level like I mean I've had games where you just run through games because you've got fans you know what yeah. I mean and they're going yeah, and they're yeah. going mental like it sounds cliche, but it genuinely like the adrenaline you get and stuff. Yeah. And I'm sure someone's done some studies on it to show how much you can go up a level. I was speaking about with my friend the other day. He'd like torn his hamstring or something, not torn it completely, but had like a proper strain in his hamstring and he just battled through 10 mm-hmm. minutes because of adrenaline and stuff. So that's always been something that's been actually a massive part because for me, one, the most enjoyable thing about football isn't training necessarily. Like I like training. I love it, yeah. but yeah. the best part is the match day. And that was one thing that was awesome about being at Flora. And, um, and I think here as well is that like they had really good fan support, uh, like really yeah. good active supporters and making lots of noise. And, um, and that makes you really engaged in the game. And it just means you feel like you're playing Definitely. something for something. Definitely, so yeah. I I can't underestimate as the the impact of fans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll move on to well before we move on actually we'll we'll say what are your future plans in football? Are you looking to stick around in Norway? You know, maybe travel yeah. across Europe, or are you looking for that you know UK club that would take you? I mean, yeah, it's kind of like an open, open-ended open one at the moment, actually. Um, I have no, like, literally no idea where I'll be at the end of the year. Um, yeah. I'm open to pretty much everything at this point in time. I'm finishing. I've done my uni degree over, over the while, and I'm finishing that. But I've also started doing some part-time work online with a company called Market Insights, and that's been, like, amazing for me. It's like football analytics, scouting, performance yeah. analysis. Okay, yeah. And I've kind of realized that there's things outside of football because I used to like put pressure on myself in terms of that there's, there's kind of this feeling in football that if you're doing something outside of football, you're not concentrating 100% on it. And I've realized this year that maybe I'm, I'm playing my best football because I have other things that keep me occupied. and. All right. And I've always been one who just wanted to do so well in football. It was probably at my detriment. So I've kind of just realized that I have to just kind of let things come. If it, like if an English club came to me in the football league or I would, I would, I would buy my hand off to go and do it because I've always said I would go to England and, and even maybe like a conference side, but I'm even open to going back to Australia and, and trying the second tier if I'm, if um and, and looking at other, other things in terms of other work and, and things like that. So yeah. it's kind of like an, yeah, it's like an open-ended one. Like I said, I was, because I've been thinking about it since, since I realized that like I'm 26, 10 and 27 now. Yeah. And that when I was younger, there was still time for me. I felt like, especially that, that window before I went to the Faroe Islands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I felt like, because I was playing in the second tier in Norway, 
and I'd played two good years, it was like, that was my time to kind of jump. And now it's like, how realistic is it? And how much do I want to, yeah. again, be away from friends and family? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. how much do I just want to be in Norway doing the same thing? Do I want to go and try something else? You know? So, yeah, mate, I have absolutely no idea what, what the future holds. Like, even from where I am now, from the first six months when I came here, like, things are, like, completely different. Like, I've started... Yeah. I've started doing coaching, which I was never doing previously. And right, I okay. doing that. So I guess I just, you know, I've realized if you make a plan, it like literally never goes to that plan. So it's just probably better just to do things in terms of like, it's a balance between you need to put um, things in place so that you're moving in a good direction in the future. For example, you need to work hard. You need to like, for example, I need to make sure I'm playing the best football I can. I need to make sure I'm doing the best work I can off the field in terms of preparation. I need to make sure I'm educating myself and, and working hard as much as possible in other areas, but not to the detriment of my football. So it's just a bit of a balance of everything, mate. I'm just going to take it as it comes. Mm, decent. So, yeah. we'll, so yeah. we'll move on to some more general questions about you know yourself, mm. um, teammates, stuff like that. Uh, we'll start with if you had to play with any player uh, from the professional game at the moment, who would you, who would it be? Who would you share the field with? I kind of almost want to share the field with someone who'd just be a bit of banter. Yeah. Like, for example, I would love to share the field with like Scott Brown in right. a Celtic Rangers derby. Yeah. And just me and him be in the middle because I love, I like, I love the intensity of it, and just me and him in the middle, just crunching people together. <laughs> like yeah. I'd hope, I'd like to say Scott Brown can play actually. Like I think he gets hard yeah. done by. I'd like to say yeah. I can play as well, but as like a right wing, like a <laughs> off field choice, I'd say like Scott Brown for a bit of banter. Yeah. Um, in terms of like a high level player, just to see the way they think and the way they play. I'd probably say Kevin De Bruyne, mate. I just mm. think he's he's just he's got everything. Like in the mod, like in the modern game now, like you just can't. Yeah. Like I just I'm love right. everything about him. Like he's not just he's not just an attacking player who does his attack and roll. Like he's a machine um, defensively. Like he's constantly running, tackling, but he's got the other side of it. Yeah. Um, and and like he said, one of his favorite quotes I saw was in Players Tribune. Was he said when like City play their best football, like it's like meditation where the team's like, it's just like they're all one organism functioning yeah. together. And so technically if I'm playing with De Bruyne, I'm on Man City's team and I'm hoping we're like meditating together, mate, as weird as that sounds. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I would say De Bruyne or Scott Brown. So you probably can get two different answers, but there you go. Yeah, two so, very yeah. different ends of the... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, We'll, we'll we'll go on to um, pre-match. What music you're listening to? Weird assortments of things, mate. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll have like like hard rap, like grime, and then right. I can have some like '80s classic thrown in there. Um, depends on my mood, really. Sometimes, like, and it also depends. Like, most of the time, it's what the guys are choosing in the changing room. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost getting to that age where I'm like looking at the younger guys, what they're playing, and I'm like, what is this rubbish? And I'm feeling like I'm 85, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's yeah, mate. I don't have, I don't have anything. I have like a, a really weird, random taste that mixes between things. So, fair yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, we'll we'll go on to teammates. We'll say, who is the most skillful player you've played with? Ah, it's got to be Harry Kuehl, mate. He was, it was right. ridiculous. It was yeah. actually like, so he came to us. I had one session with him at Victory. Yeah. He came to us kind of towards the end of his career. Yeah. And like, it was just, it was just streaks above everyone. Like he was, his left foot, like could literally just do anything. Like I remember just watching them doing shooting and he was just, everything was in the back of the net. Like, and it was so easy. Like it wasn't, he wasn't straining. He wasn't hitting the ball hard. He's just, and then, and then 
it, one of the things I really noticed was like I was playing like for some reason right wing or something in one of the games. Mm-hmm. Not sure why. Um, maybe it was a right back who bombed on, and like I remember making a run, and he actually had his back to me, and I thought there's n- like there's zero chance he's seen me here. I don't know why I made the run. But I made the run and then I just like looked up and the ball just like popped over my head straight onto my foot. Yeah. I think I probably butchered the chance knowing me. But like I remember thinking at the time, like, whole like, wow, this guy's on level another level yeah. that he's seen that literally like through the back of his head. So he was he was an amazing player. Um and Marco Rojas, we had a guy at Victory. In terms of like individual dribbling skills, if you watch his goal against Newcastle, that will give you a taste of the type of feet he had he was amazing um player so i would probably say those two in europe ones that i've trained with it would be it would be those two guys mm. Mm. in the dressing room who who's the funniest player you've been with in a dressing room who, who who plays pranks you know stuff like that pranksters i wouldn't actually say at the clubs i've been at in in Norwegian culture, like, that doesn't really go on. Okay. It's not a thing. Um, Norwegians, and I hope I'm not, like, I'm probably, like, generalizing massively. It's not that they're not funny at all. They they have a laugh. But I've we've always said that, like, in Norwegian culture, it's a bit like they've got this thing where, like, being humble and no one thinking they're, like, standing out from the crowd you don't really do it. So if you're quite like loud and playing pranks in the change room, like it's, it's never really been a thing. So it's always been the foreign guys. Um, okay. I guess when I was at victory, it was like Lee Broxham was always, always probably the main prankster there. Definitely. Brebsy, I was a little bit around Grant Brebsy is actually the head coach. Now I was a little bit around him and Kevin and Archie Thompson, actually, he was one of them. So at Breenham, me and, one of the guys, Josh, had done a few little things, but like we say, we know that like it's a bit of a bit of a thin line in Norway, so we kind of tend to keep the pranks, yeah, pranks to to a minimum. So yeah, I think it's that's probably one of the things I've missed about going to like an English change room was okay. because they've got that banter. Like it was yeah, like yeah. when I was when I was with Kitty, that was like one of the things. So um, I would say that's actually like a bit of a cultural thing that that from my experience, isn't something that massively happens in Norway. Right. So, but I would put Broxy, Lee Broxham, Archie Thompson up there as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Who, who have you seen in a dress room that has the worst dress sense? It's hard. Like if you ask me like this team now, I mean, I'm not going to throw Josh Robson out there because you know, he's actually one of my friends, so I don't want to ruin anything we had. But at the moment, I would say, I'm not going to go dress sense. I think that could be harsh. But Christopher Hay, one of the boys we've got here, is rocked up with, like, bubblegum coloured boots. Um, so I was thinking straight away that that was a bit of a rash decision from his end. So, yeah. I mean, I, in the Faroe Islands, I'll be honest, mate, there was a lot of poor, like, some guys coming straight from work. And so you can right. imagine what that was like. So I'd actually say yeah. I'd nominate half the Faroe Islands and half the team I had there. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, we'll do two. We'll do um, who's the best player you've played with and the best player you've played against? Yeah, so like I said, Harry Kuehl, would be the best player yeah. I played with, even though it was yeah. very briefly. Um, mm-hmm. And I put Mark Milligan up there as well. He was he was actually very close to going to Palace mm-hmm. in um, from Australia. He's an exceptional player. Um, and then, yeah, I guess in Norway there's been like yeah a few players, but those are the main ones. In terms of played against, I played against a player called Engelar. Um, and he'd played in, he'd actually played, I'm not sure if it was a final, but he'd played in the Euros for the Netherlands. And he right. came on, he came on loan to, no, he came to Australia. He popped the goal in from halfway. If, if yeah. you can imagine that, like, give you a bit of a, his level. But um, 
he so he had broke his leg when he came and then so he played a youth game against us right and this guy is literally like six foot seven mm. and you would not imagine how easy someone who's six foot seven managed to find space on the pitch like because i was in the midfield against him and i was like constantly like keep your eye on him get near him when he gets the ball don't give him any time because he has a really good passing range yeah and like he just i just turned my back and he's on the ball and he's got like five yards of space and i was just like and like his distribution on the ball was just incredible Mm -hmm. um so i would say so i would say him um i played against a norwegian boy called jens petter holger he was at buddha glimt when i was playing buddha glimt I would actually say he's probably going to go on to maybe be the best player I've played against because he's unreal. He's like, he's 18, 19. He's playing in the tip in the top division at the moment um, in, in Norway. So I would probably say where are them two and there was Matthias Norman. He's playing now in Rostov. So I've been lucky to play against some really good players in Norway, actually. Um, but a lot of them have been younger guys and they're guys yeah. who will probably go on and play, play at a higher level. So, so I would say those kind of players. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then five aside, um, players you've played with, who would you put in a five aside team? Just for bad. So I put my brother in there. Just right. because I feel like we have a bit of a tele- telepathy on the pitch, although we haven't yeah. played together for a few years. Um, to be honest, mate, we were speaking about it the other day. Like, I love, I love beautiful football, but sometimes you just need players who you I need players who will work as well. Yeah. So, if I'm doing a five side, I'll probably get Josh Robson in there. Um, yeah. Throw my brother in there, me, and then players I've played with. I reckon I'd throw Marco Rojas in there for a bit of, because his feet are just insane. So I think he'd be absolutely ridiculous. So I'd throw him in there and then I would throw... You know, I'm going to bid my brother. I'm going to, he's going to get the sack. Okay. I'm going to bring Mills in for my brother. And I'm going to have um, Billy Seleski in there as well. So we've got a bit of a mix of players. Mm. Um, that's a hard one, mate. You, you should have given me a bit of warning before I was doing them because I'm probably <laughs> off- offending a few people. It's probably some yeah, probably forgotten. Plays I've one. I've never I've never thought about that one, mate. So yeah, mm. it was an yeah. interesting interesting question. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, and then um, before we round it off, any any shout outs you want to make? I've got nothing, mate. Yeah, <laughs> I'll shout. I'll shout. Yeah, I've got nothing, mate. I'll shout out <laughs> Norway's weather at the moment. That's the best thing yeah. I can think of. It's still all right, yeah. mate. So, um, yeah, we'll give it that one. So, yeah. Anyways, Luke, thank you for joining me. Uh, appreciate your time. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be looking out in the future, whether it be in Norway, uh, somewhere in Europe, or maybe in England one day. Um, Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I'll be keeping a lookout and, you know, Hopefully we'll see you on a on the bigger stage soon. Cheers, mate. Really, honestly, really appreciate the um, taking the t- you taking the time out and and the detail you had in terms of the questions. I thought you had some great questions, mate. So, cheers. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Free for a chat any time of the day or whenever. I'll try and make sure I'm on time and mm-hmm. um, and ready to chat. So yeah, mate. Cheers for having us. Nice one. Cheers. Cheers. No worries. Thank All you. Right.